Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are going to continue with our second speaker, uh, Jeroen Stout, creator of Dinner Date and of the upcoming game with the most unpronounceable <laughs> name ever, Cheung Sum. Cheung Sum. Th that. Um, I think I'm just going to let you get started. Um, it's a talk about not taking the easy way out when thinking <laughs> about game ideas. To, to some extent. Lovely. Oh. <laughs> Give it a go. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeroen Stout. Thank you. Just to check, I did, I did just unmute it. Yeah, right. Did. Okay. Just to, uh, just to check. So hello, my name is Jeroen Stout. And uh, three years ago, I made a game called Dinner Date, in which you play the subconsciousness of a man called Julian Luxemburg. As he's waiting for his date to show up, you sit at his kitchen table and you look at the clock, you tap the table, you eat the bread, and all the while you listen to his thoughts. And once I finished the game, and it, it had some popularity in a way, I was, I was quite convinced I would make another game. And now, three years later, I've, I've sort of been confronted with the fact that Dinner Date was a bit of, a, bit of luck, really, to have been made in that time. I had, a, I had an assignment which had nothing to do with making a game, and, and for a laugh I thought I'd just make a game, which, which eventually became Dinner Date. But I had about two days to write the script, and it was a day of recording, and then it was basically just a week of designing, and then from there on it, it sort of went from I might release this for free to I might offer this for payment to sort of the, the full release. And with Tung Sum, the, the moment I started, I knew I have quite a lot of time to work on this. So, in a way, for three years, I've been making a lot of things, throwing them away again. And for the first time, I had to think why I made Dinner Date. Whereas with Dinner Date, I never had the time, and it was sort of rebellious thinking. And this has led me to... If I move my cursor out of the way... To... Uh, a statement which I've, I've recently begun to see as, as a staple of the industry, which is inherently damaging to the industry. It's, it's not actually the, the, the often repeated quote, because I didn't really want to attack a person rather than the thought of it. But the idea that games are about meaningful choice or about consequence to your actions, I think is a very problematic thing, which on the surface sounds very good, but it has led us to to this. It has led us to the lie of the grandfather clock. But I'm not going to sort of head on do this. What I'm going to do is, is talk for a moment about what games are, as dangerous as that is. I think the human mind has a very curious capacity in the sense that we don't just look at the world and make assumptions about the world and think about how things function, but we're also able momentarily to suspend our disbelief. We're able to orchestrate things, we're able to uh, treat a football in the game of football as something that you're literally not capable of picking up with your hands. Games, in that sense, are a facilitation. There are things we want to do, to experience, to measure, that we otherwise could not do. If I and a friend want to see who could reach the other side of this, this room first, the problem would be that unless we agree on some parameters, we could, not never, we could never really agree on which was there first. We could say that one of us had a head start or that one of us was not really uh, uh, wearing the proper gear. But if we turn this into a game and we say, well, there are these, these rules, we're essentially in this magic circle, then we can say, well, we have an objective measurement of our, of our speeds, and we can say which is the fastest. The French philosopher uh, Roger Cowart had four categories, argon, aleia, mimicry, and illinx, which are challenge, chance, pretense, and vertigo. And he based his model around games facilitating these things, although I don't believe he used the word facilitation. If we think about games about meaningful choice or consequence to our actions, what we can say then is that these games are facilitating consequence. Essentially, they allow us to inha inhabit a world in which our actions are meaningful, in which they have consequences. But at the same time, I also am very much a storyteller, and I like to tell stories. So this presentation on the whole is, for instance, has nothing to do with, with say, roguelike games. Rather. If we are trying to combine games with telling a story, we run into a problem that we have consequence and a fixed or branching narrative. Now, I want to propose two types of interaction that I want to sort of just put here as a priori, because it's not worth the time to explain why these two would be... Uh, let's just go with it, I mean. We have continuous fuzzy and sequential branching. 
Uh, this will the, the top one will of course look very familiar from basically any uh, game development book which has a branching storyline. The bottom one uh, I would like to represent as essentially the game world. We have a, a number of objects with a number of properties. There's an Im immense amount of data and there are rules of a simulation which bind them together. The, the differences between these two, or rather, there are, there are many variations, I should say, but that, that's sort of obvious in the sense that the top one branches can collapse again, they can spread again at the ending, create multiple endings, or they can all collapse again in a sort of mass effect way and not have any different endings. There is, you can have a level structure which basically says level two remembers nothing of level one. Um, I, I, I realized this when, when Half-Life modding, there was essentially a flag that said this level remembers, the, uh, doesn't remember the levels before it, so it just throws out all the information. And of course, a, a fuzzy logic can essentially drive a branching, branching narrative and all these things. So from a technical perspective, what is, what is the interesting difference between these is that a branching narrative, you can essentially store very little information about where the player is. You can say on which branch he is and potentially where on the branch he is in, in terms of a time. That means that, in, for instance, in a choose your own adventure novel, you basically have a page number and a paragraph, and, and if you really want to get into it, like which word in a paragraph. At the same time, in a fuzzy system, there is no real position for the player, there's no actual uh, reality in that sense, but there is a lot of numbers which mean things, potentially. And this, this difference is, is nicely illustrated by, for instance, Riven, which was a game from a very long... I, I don't actually remember when Riven was made. It's so long ago that, that visuals in Riven, which then were rendered over a period of days after heavy optimization, could now be rendered on the fly easily, almost. But with Riven, it was so much information, so much difficult information, that the only choice was to essentially present the game in a branching structure. We have locations, and that's all the information the system could handle at that point. Whereas if a game, a game like, like Half-Life, or, or essentially any of these, these variations of games, they have still, their levels are still in this sense static and branching, their textures are still static, their models are of course still static, but there's a large amount of information about the skeletons of the models, the behavioral states of the models. Every, every element in this level has its own little bit of data. And if you, if you look into a save file from uh, an average shooter game, you can see just how much information this really is. Because to us it seems normal that this bottle can be in, in different locations, but the game has to remember all this information. Uh, this is also why save points have become such a, such a popular thing to do, of course. From experience point of view, if we, if we stick to purely a branching thing, we can say that the player forms his own narrative based on, on just a few choices, really. There isn't that much to choose unless there are many, many branches. But there's, there's sort of a, a real path that the player sees as actually having happened. Of course, all the branches already exist at the moment you play the game, but only a few, few branches are seen and that gives the, the idea that you have your path in the game. Meanwhile, in the, in the fuzzy levels, there's the inter interesting element that when you do something, it changes the world in a way which sort of ripples out. And over time, you can say it dissipates. If you, at the start of a level, move a box, that box will remain moved. It's not that if you move, the box will move back because the game doesn't remember that sort of thing. But also, over time, there is a chance that this box will be moved by someone else, say. So there is a sort of outward-inward motion that you can associate with the consequences of your actions. Going from a, a developer point of view, we can say that the fuzzy logic exists in a form of hyperstate. It is multiple things at the same time. It's, it's essentially Schrodinger's cat. Unless we measure what the player is doing, he isn't really doing anything specific. Essentially, if the player has a health bar, but we don't measure it, the player can be alive and dead, as far as the game is concerned. Every time we do something with fuzzy logic, in, in the sense of having a judgment over it, we have to change it into a branch, essentially. Dying or finishing the level are two branches that come from one fuzzy bit of logic. 
And there are sort of words which you can start to associate with this, such as squeezing sort of some information out, cutting information if you, if you store some information but not other information, and, and the judging which I mentioned, which is, which is essentially a way of coping with the fact that fuzzy logic has absolutely no meaning for the computer and branching has a clearly defined purpose. Now, these two sort of lend themselves to uh, different types of behavior. So, narrative, for instance, depends on a lot of information which cannot really be simulated at, at real time. Whereas action, for instance, require fuzzy, requires fuzzy logic because you need enough variables to actually have the feeling that you're doing something. Of course, a, uh, a, uh, a quick-time event is essentially a, a branching bit of, of action sequence, which is as far as branching can can theoretically go. This, this sort of leads to an artistic problem. It's, it's not that, that game developers have chosen sort of a model for making games that just happen to be nice at the time. That there is a problem that if you do anything with, with games, for instance, these days going back to full motion video or, or full, of motion capture, as it's called these days, but it's essentially full motion video. Because what we're doing again is we're recording with, with very expensive, difficult equipment, a thing that we want to play back in exactly the same way. We spent a lot of money to re replicate facial muscles and so, that sort of thing, and then we play it linearly back. But it's sort of like Riven, in, in the same way that in, in the 90s we couldn't actually render Riven in real time as much as we wanted to. We cannot really do much in real time when it comes to games like, for instance, Heavy Rain. A lot of things have to be pre-composed, they have to be pre-created. And as much as you want the freedom of, um, of the fuzzy logic, essentially you'd like to have that first stability, and there's a lot of you know, uh, imaginations about what future AI will and will not be able to do. But something as simple as voice is already an immense problem. Say we have a character who can have, say, four moods, and he can say four samples that essentially are the same sentence but said in different moods. But perhaps he's at the very same time also either working an anvil or pulling a rope or sewing a cloth. So this would sort of be 12 samples at this point, but perhaps it's morning and he hasn't had coffee yet, and perhaps it's evening, perhaps you've just mildly upset him with something you said, but he can't really remember what it was. If we expand this, you get as essentially uh, an, an ever-increasing hypercube of possibilities. And not only is it difficult to get voice actors to do this accurately, it is also simply technically and, and certainly financially impossible to do this sort of thing because you'd spend as much recording one sentence as now you could spend on an entire game. This is why the number of branches is always limited when there is a content problem. So going from this, we can say fuzzy facilitates action because having fuzzy logic makes it quite easy to do something action. Uh, but narrative requires sequences. We cannot actually do narrative that well in terms of uh, fuzzy. And this leads to the clock. We essentially have two things which we both want to do, but we cannot do them at the same time. So what a lot of games have started to do, apart from sort of the audio diary route, is having a bit of action and then alternating it with a bit of narrative. With, which is almost a complete switch within the, the logic of the game. The whole game world changes, the logic of the game world changes, who is the hero potentially changes during a cutscene, as compared to, to the action scene. There is, there is in effect, a, a form of pendulum that swings back and forth, which goes with a tick-tock, tick-tock. We do a bit of action, we do a bit of narrative, we do a bit of action, we do a bit of narrative. And having this means that in a very strange and potentially very clever way. We're essentially blending two things which have no right to be together in some sense. And we believe at the same time that we have agency and that we have pathos for a character. Uh, this, of course, leading to sort of the, the word uh, ludonarrative dissonance, which I've promised myself not to throw around too much. But it's, it's a Nathan Drake effect. Nathan Drake shoots a few hundred people. And I, I don't say that lightly. He literally shoots a few hundred people because he has a ring with treasure. Also, he, has, he shoots a few hundred people. But we, we accept this because in the action sequences, of course we shoot people. It's not very strange to shoot people in action sequences. And because he's so lovable in the cutscenes, well, he's a bit of a, an arrogant bastard in my view, but he's so lovably arrogant bastard. He shoots a few hundred people, but we accept this because we've been sort of just doing this thing back and forth, and we accept both situations at the same time. It's a form of double think. Now, you might ask, 
Why is that bad? I've just illustrated why it's a technical necessity and an artistic necessity, and it sort of seems like it's the only solution. So let, but let's go in with that still. This is bad because everything must be intercuttable. We have, a, we have a quite a, an amount of freedom, but essentially Nathan Drake must be someone who will at some point shoot people, because otherwise what would he do? And this, this is a problem which, which I found very, very amusing with the new Bioshock game, where people, for, for the first time publicly, it seemed, started to say, why is there so much violence? To which other people said, well, it's very simple. Booker is, is an ex-Pinkerton, and he's a very aggressive man, so he's falling back into this. Yes, of course he is, because Booker has been written to shoot people. It's not that they wrote Booker and then thought, you know what would go well with this character? It's a bit of shooting. Let's add a bit of shooting. These things have been made together. That in itself is not a problem. Many things have been made well to go well together. But the problem is that if you want to make something else, you have to make something, essentially, which is intercuttable with... And I use violence, but of course that is a, a broader category that I just call violence because it sounds more... Uh, um, it sounds more bad, really, I suppose. There's sort of rules... Uh, I wouldn't say rules make objectification, but they encourage objectification. There's a, there's a difference between a character on which we... Th the question, can we bed Alistair, for instance, depends very much on our actions. And in choosing answers, it is easy to start choosing answers which you know the outcome of. You're essentially gaming people in the system in a way that you wouldn't approach them within... Uh, say, literature or film in which, you have that, in which you don't have that interaction with them. That linked to gameplay being at odds with an authorial narrative in the sense that you cannot always tell a story if you cannot get the player to play along to that story. If you want to give the player a lot of freedom, that also means you essentially uh, have to choose a story in which the player has the sort of freedom that he wants to have and that he plays along with you. And it strikes me as false, which is perhaps more an aesthetic judgment, that at one point there is an element of... of and I, again, I suppose Bioshock Infinite sort of wears it on its sleeve at some point, in which it doesn't really seem to be ashamed anymore that it's trying to do two things together in a way. It's not pretending anymore. It, it, it's become a form of musical, in which characters talk and then they start shooting instead of singing. And that, again, that is not bad, but it doesn't work for all stories in a way. And of course, spring is here and the world is larger than games. There's, there are a lot of things which uh, have somehow nothing to do with games. A lot of paintings, a lot of works, a lot of books, a lot of experiences you may have in daily life. A book like Little Women couldn't be turned into a game unless you start adding something to it which is completely contrasting with the book itself. Uh, the Wong Kar Wai films have... have a lot of action which in, in no way could be turned into violence or say multiple choice, but I suppose technically multiple choice, but then you, you're damaging the authorial view again, I suppose. We can look at ballet, we can look at, at an experience of horse riding, which I have seen done reasonably well in books or films, but, but not really in a game. There have been moments in games in which you ride a horse, but it hasn't been a continual experience, I'd argue. And my, my favorite series, of, above all, I think the high point of television in the history of mankind, um, if I can make that judgment, is, is Deadwood. And Deadwood is, is a Western in which almost nobody shoots a lot of it. There's a lot of violence, but there's no real Western-y violence. Everything is subdued. There are a lot of characters. I'd like to be in Deadwood. But if, if that means that I have to start shooting or that I have to start solving puzzles, it sort of becomes a little bit of... a uh, not Deadwood, in essence. So the knee-jerk reaction might be that I've, I've just explained two sides, essentially, which I can polarize and sort of state as opposite ends of, of one pendulum. At one end, we have that, that narrative, and at the other end, we have this shooty bit that I, I'm speaking so, so low of. You might say, why? let's just get rid of the shooty bit. And that's something which, which has sort of been done, and which is, in a way, not bad, but sort of a bit dangerous. The idea is that once we start stripping things that are, are gamey, to use that word again, we sort of end up with walking, it seems very lot. Or in the case of platform games, we end up with walking and jumping. Or we, we end up with walking and pressing a button every now and then, or not pressing a button every now and then. That in itself is, is not bad. I think Dear Esther is, is one of the most important pieces of this, of this century, if I can make another statement like that. 
But the problem is, if it is dear Esther from here on until forever, there is still an enormous amount of the human experience which we cannot put in this type of game. A dear Esther game will always be, in some sense, about walking. The moment you add something to it, then, then the real questions start, in a way. But I've, I've been a bit... Um, of, of course, I've been leading you on, because I started with, with essentially a strawman argument, which is meaningful choice uh, being, being what games are about. Meaningful choice is not really what games are about. And to illustrate this, I'd sort of like to treat it in a, in a slightly different way. So the question is, what are consequences? What are the consequences to our actions? Because if we start saying games are about choice, then we must sort of have an idea of what these choices are. Not, not in a literal sense, if I could go left or right, but what does that mean? Because there are moments in a game when I feel that the game has mistreat, mistreated me. I, I reject the authority of the game that that man has shot me because I feel I didn't have a choice. This is anger at spawn camping, I suppose. But there are moments that I feel I did something while in re realistic uh, programming terms, I didn't really do anything but play a cutscene at the end of the game. We can take an autobiographical view then of games. We can say a player has a choice when he feels he has a choice. Because if, if we truly live in a deterministic universe and our brains truly are, in essence, just uh, biological computers, then we don't have free will anyway. It's, it's all predetermined, in essence, what we do. But we feel we have free will. Free will, in some sense, and that's, is, is not technically an illusion, but it's a feeling. Just like feeling happy, you can feel you have agency. And this, of course, cuts to a lot of, of different subjects, such as feminism or... or uh, the issues surrounding racism, where groups can feel they don't, for instance, have a voice within the industry or within larger life. Of course, I was thinking about the game industry immediately saying feminism, but um, there's an idea of voice and silence. Perhaps you have free will in a game, but you don't feel that you're allowed to have free will in a game. Making these things more complicated then allows us to uh, use these three sentences as uh, a lead-on to, to sort of get rid of this clock, I hope to promise. Let's say games facilitate things. That was my opening argument. I'm going to take that as a priori because defending that statement would mean I would have to pick something even more abstract as a base point. Games can facilitate consequence is the uh, sub-consequence sub, uh, of the first one. The third consequence can be real. It's, it's the thing we're essentially challenging at this point. The idea of of winning, and, and in making this presentation I was, I was being particularly facetious and I realized at some point that I felt somewhat proud of finishing Half-Life 2, uh, back when, back when Half-Life still existed in a way. Uh, I had defeated the Combine, but of course I did no such thing. In essence, I triggered a series of events which played a cutscene. The cutscene already existed on my hard drive before I had even started the game. The cutscene existed on the CD. The cutscene has existed for months at Valve's headquarters. And yet I felt that I somehow had defeated the Combine. But that, in many ways, is an illusion which is nice to have. It's nice to feel that I did this thing. But it doesn't mean I actually did do that thing. And you can say that, that some games are free for some and, and limited for others. Someone suggested that I mention GTA, because that is a game in which you have much freedom. But not if you want to sit down and make a painting. If you want to do that in, in GTA, you absolutely have no choice. And I, I would like to offer that, actually, as an argument for people who say, well, but games allow you to do many things. Well, only if those are the things you want to do. And people who complain, for instance, about Dear Esther not having any choice, they simply don't recognize the choices you have in Dear Esther as being valid choices, whereas they might recognize them in another game in another shape. I would like to coin in that sense the, the term pathetic agency. There is not so much the question of do we really have agency, but do we accept or or are inclined to think we have agency. If we, if we watch a TV series, we can potentially say these characters are real, we believe in these characters. Or we can say this is just a bunch of actors on a bad set. And in how far you're willing to do this, in a sense, also applies to games. If you believe that you have free will, you can suspend your disbelief. Of course, we know it, it's, it's really very limited what you can do in games, but the illusion is, is very potent and not actually a bad thing. But it is a bad thing if it becomes the whole of it. If we start thinking that we're not just using an illusion, but that is what games are about, in a sense. Because if we say games can facilitate consequence, 
then the question is, why consequence? Because if, say, I had just said games are about consequence, real consequence, then we might say, okay, well, if, if that's what they are about. But if we say games facilitate the illusion of consequence, then what other illusions can games potentially give you? And why would we actually go for, for this particular sense of consequence? In this, I think there's, there's a thing which my parents always, always sort of annoy me about with chili sauce. I like to add chili sauce to things, but they're afraid that at one point I will add chili sauce to absolutely everything for the fear that I otherwise would not taste anything. In that sense, we can almost see how certain forms of interaction, which on their own are not bad, just like chili sauce is not bad on its own, have become something which are needed for the game to be valid, to be validated as a game, to be valid as a, a thing you can do. And then a game like Dear Esther or Proteus comes along, and Proteus is, is, makes people even madder than Dear Esther in some way, because, because there's nothing to do, and it's not a game. I, I do believe that people are missing their chili sauce in a way. If Proteus would add something which had nothing to do with the story, but you can collect something, or you can, you can shoot at someone every minute or so, suddenly that would change things, because it's a recognizable taste, because there's something in there. And in this, I would like to say we have the clock because we wanted consequence, but we don't have consequence because we simply have a clock. The clock is a constraint which we have to, to endure because we wanted consequences to actions and we wanted a narrative. And I don't believe these things can be married unless we make such advances within uh, AI or, or such things as at this point are unimaginable, essentially. The world would change more than games would change if we had that kind of AI. So if we change the basic assumption, if we, if we change away from the idea that games have to have consequence, we can say, what else will games give us? And this will avoid the walking game dystopia. And leading me to why games are bad at consequence, in a way. Which is just, just a, bit of a bit of fun. I, I like to think games are bad at violence, which I'll get back to at the end of this. If we rethink interaction, the, the modes which I sketched are pretty much uh, unchangeable. We cannot somehow say, well, there's no consequence, so we can avoid this. But the relationship between these two modes is somewhat different. The top one is, in essence, now always a judgment of the fuzzy logic. The fuzzy logic can do anything it wants, basically, as long as it's not measured. Because when it's measured, it has to collapse, it has to change, it has to be judged. As long as the player doesn't want consequence, however, we, we can stay with this bit. If the player doesn't mind moving boxes around for an hour, and he would be happy with this, then the game never actually needs to leave that fuzzy bit. It can be a perfect experience of what it is like to be moving boxes. This leads me to meaningless interaction, which is not meaningless in, in a purely academic term, because in a paper I would never use the word meaningless to define this, but it is as, as opposed to meaningful interaction, or what is usually meant by this. If we say our actions have consequence, I saved the universe in Mass Effect, then something which has absolutely no consequence, which you do for an hour or perhaps a few days, becomes meaningless interaction. But meaningless interaction allows us to never open that box. We can forever have that fuzzy interaction and just keep with it. So what else can we make games do? We can have games facilitate, let's say, Embodiment. Let's say we just play a game because we want to feel like what it is like to be in another person's body. And some years after making it, that's sort of what I realized Dinner Date was. When I originally made it, I did say, you are Julian Luxemburg. But in saying that, people would say, oh, well, you can't get up. Julian Luxemburg would get up. And I would say, well, no, he's sort of the person who wouldn't get up. But the experience of Dinner Date is not at all really about being Julian Luxemburg. It's about being in his body, in a way, of having a very limited amount of interactions which hopefully support being in his body, or support the illusion of being in his body. In that way, games can also facilitate presence. We can have a simple scene which perhaps has dialogue, which perhaps has some animations, um, and we can add little things for the player to do. The player in this scene could, could roll around in, his, in the grass, could readjust his hair, or her hair, I suppose, if we talk about the body. Um, we can do various things. Uh, someone suggested making a chain out of flowers, which I thought was a very a daisy chain. 
uh, which I thought was very potent. A lot of things can be done within this scene as long as they don't influence any dialogue. The moment you could, for instance, anger someone, you'd say, well, ha we need another branch. But as long as nothing really happens in that sense, we can keep with this scene. We can, we can make this scene last a long time. And, and why, might you ask? Because we like to be in this scene. We actually like the, the illusion of lying in the grass with the, the wind in our hair, listening to other people chatting around us. We can add little other things to this. We can add, uh, leading sort of to, to my part about tongue sum, we can add little things like, for instance, facial movement. We can make the player change facial movement. That's something which is potentially fuzzy. Essentially, what I'm saying is that if we use games to facilitate acting rather than, than consequence, we can do a lot. It, think of it as a rock band for actors. You, you're given a situation which is in no way as confronting as actually being on a stage or having to actually learn your lines or to do any of that, that difficult stuff, for which, which you might enjoy but which you might not have the years to spend on in a way. But instead you have a game which for a moment gives you the illusion of allowing yourself to feel like you're someone else, to think like someone else, and at the end you can go back to, to your life and, uh, well, think about it, I suppose. With Dinner Date, I very much had the theory of, of keeping it separated. So I said we have essentially the dialogue, we have the fuzzy gameplay, which is the interactions, but they never really meet. There, there is a sort of limitation that the game says, now you're allowed to drink wine, now you're allowed to eat bread. But at the same time, it's basically an audio diary, but you eat bread while the audio, audio diary plays. With Chung Sam, I want to have more, or wanted, that's why I made this, uh, have more interaction from one to the other, which is not interaction. I want to have more action from the linear bit to the fuzzy bit. I didn't want them to remain unconnected. So, leading to Chung Sam. Chung Sam is a, uh, I'm always inclined to say short love story, but it sort of grew to 90 minutes and it no longer is a, a short love story. But it's also a story about people. I, I like to, to think that a love story shouldn't really be that much about love, but rather about the people uh, and, and what influence, if you will, love has on them. So it's a character study. There's no real goal in that sense to the game. The idea that at the end of the game she might decide to like you or not is, is silly. Because that's not what, what would happen in essence in real life. Because there are two characters who are in such a way unique that it's almost bound to happen whatever will happen during the game. There is a, the predestination of literature, if you will. The idea that people are a certain way which is unescapable. The game therefore is linear to, to the millisecond. Um, and the, the more we've been working on it, the more it has become literally linear to the millisecond, in that every playthrough of the game will last exactly as long as, as the previous one. But all the game has fuzzy interaction. There's no moment in the game where we sort of take control away. Well, there are a few seconds, I suppose, here and there, which is unavoidable, but that's, that's the downside I'll explain later. It is quite beyond dinner date in the sense that there are two characters. That was something which I was quite adamant to have. I didn't really want... This is sort of like the dystopia of walking games, in essence, that if I didn't figure out how to make characters interact in a meaningless uh, way, I would just have a series of games like a series of Dear Esters would be. And we would be forever stuck at a table or at a bus stop, which was my next idea. Um, I didn't quite want that. So the question became, what can be fuzzy? There are several things which clearly cannot be fuzzy, such as speech. I cannot have an actress say a line six times just because the player influences it. The problem also becomes that the player will start gaming that system, in essence. If I make an angry Maggie, which is her name, if I make an angry Maggie and a happy Maggie, there is sort of a trick to kind of go like, oh, let's see how angry actually I can make her. I want the interaction, that interaction to be natural in that sense. Going for facial expressions, head spine movement and hand movement seem to be the ideal thing. Because even though my voice is continuous right now, it, I can do various things with my hands. Various things that may not be congruous, I might be making motions which in no way uh, underline what I'm saying. But as long as I say the player is an actor, I can sort of expect him, or from a game sense, just only honor him when he does the right actions. If the player starts doing strange things, the game just ignores him because it's not worth it, in a sense, to start responding to that sort of thing. But as long as his actions sort of fit within that script that the game has, the player can do hand movements, can make facial motions, and sort of turn and, and uh, twist about. And through uh, 
a, a difficult journey through AI. I realized that Maggie can respond to facial animations, to head spine movement, and to the hand movement, because for her, the exact same rules apply. She has a fixed script, but within that script, there is, there is the, the freedom to smile at a particular moment or not, to look away at a particular moment or not. This led me to a driver model. The idea is the player character has metrics. He exhibits uh, signs of, of uh, behavior. This can be smiling, this can be looking away, this can be uh, moving his hand in a certain way. The Maggie character reads this out and she treats everything as a delta, so to say. There is no real um, definitive state in that sense. What happened is Maggie is, to some extent, an animation to, to determine her basic pose. But from that moment on, where her head is looking, what her head is doing, is unknown, essentially, to the game. So when she responds to the player, say she might make a little nod, it doesn't really matter if her head is here or it is pointing in the other direction. She can always nod a little bit. She can always turn towards the player, to some extent, without going for a complete overruling of everything that existed before. And if you think back to the experience for a player of having fuzzy logic, it is that rippling out and diminishing of his influence. In that sense, Maggie's face sort of becomes your own, just like in real life, uh, the actions you exhibit influence someone else and their actions also become your own, in a way. But over time, the narrative again will, of course, ensure that Maggie at the right points is smiling or is frowning, and that sort of slowly diminishes whatever you did to her face. So it it kind of ripples out and then, of course, you're tempted to do new things, especially if you're actually treating this as an actor and treating her reactions then as a confirmation that you're doing something. This means never opening the box. I never actually say, oh, you've been making Maggie smile for so long, now this thing will happen. Rather, I keep that all in one bit and the others all in, in the other bit. And the linear bit will say, Maggie has to smile at this point, Maggie has to look away now. But that doesn't mean that she overrules the action. I'm, I'm hoping you can sort of see the lines now I'm looking at it, but... This essentially is, is Maggie in terms of behavior. We have to start with, with the player at the, the left top. The player exhibits some things which become the metrics, which are interpreted by Maggie's reaction system. It, it turned out that I cannot really write one uniform AI that can treat every si single situation. That would be an immense simulation. So rather her responses and her AI are branching throughout the game in a sense. For, for different scenes, she has different behaviors. So Benedict, which is, which is not named after the Pope, uh, but after Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, who is an actor, therefore it seemed logical. Benedict controls which instance, which branch essentially of Maggie we are, are seeing right now in the game, which high level behavior she is exhibiting. So the way your actions are interpreted will again, uh, the, well, one line goes straight to the drivers, to her face, for instance. That is, that is the shortest route, in, in essence. Because if you smile, someone will micro-smile back, in a way. There is a little element to this. But in some scenes, for instance, if you frown and she's telling something very personal, the reaction might be to not, uh, well, the reaction might be, in this sense, to frown as well. In a scene where she's being slightly more assertive, in which she's more playing with you, in essence, frowning might result in her smiling. This is, of course, an artistic choice more than an AI choice. I don't really store her mood in that sense, but rather say what reactions she has. There's a little bit between the actual other reactions and, um, and the input, because there needs to be some leeway, in essence, for the AI to really make uh, coherent choices. Because choices of humans happen over time rather than sort of instantaneous every time. So that I create several tensions, which her mental block, in a way, which has a master again, just like the AI, um, or rather, just like the reactions. This, this block determines several higher level things, in essence, such as um, whether she's looking at you or not. There might be a tension, a requirement for her to look in your eyes. If you've been not looking at her, that tension builds up. But if you've been maintaining eye contact for quite a time, that tension will mean that she will want to face away. That leads to, to the minus. The master sort of checks constantly all these different values and says, okay, we need a little bit of behavior that gets her head away, in essence. Um, 
that leads to quite versatile behavior because the AI is not so much saying play this animation, but the miners are rather tasked through the drivers to make Maggie look away. This is part of a very difficult problem in, in the way humans act, because if there's someone here and I'm turning to face this person, I'm not actually facing this person in a way. But if I already was facing the person and I want to switch to a mode in which I am facing the person, I'm not going to turn my head away while still looking at the person. The driver solved this problem by essentially saying, Maggie has to look towards the player. It doesn't really matter what she's doing at that point. It's just that the drivers make sure that she will look towards the player. The the, the Benedict has a direct link to the drivers as well. Benedict might say, Maggie at this point has to look away because it just looks good narratively. But that is a complete overruling. But also the way Maggie talks with her face or with her hands are things that Benedict will tell the drivers. And drivers might say, well, Maggie's sort of busy right now, so her head movement will not be as extreme. Because there is a measurable difference between someone facing you or not uh, in terms of what your hands will do. So it is possible that you do something, you frown at a certain point, which will sort of uh, lessen her enthusiasm, so to speak. And if she's moving her hands, she might actually decide to stop moving her hands. Benedict, which is a completely linear thing, doesn't know this. It keeps sending, uh, I suppose in a sort of very sad way, it keeps sending these signals of move your hand like this, move your face like this. But Maggie's drivers have decided for that for the next five seconds she's not going to move her hands. The, there's a sort of small sub bit with, with the poses, which, which are a tremendous problem because, of course, there are, are different situations and different uh, ways in which she can be. But that sort of uh, is, is manageable, I suppose. The drivers send things to, to Hebe, which is sort of the, the body system, or rather the, the physical body, if you will, and, and Capellia, which I use as, as an animation system. This means a lot of things are offset, so a lot of things are not... I don't have a list of canned hand animations. Because if I have 16 hand animations to do a sort of thing, that there's a repetition, to be sure. But it also cannot react to you. In a way, if you make her uh, slightly nervous and touch her, touch her ear, I don't want the, the main Benedict to know this. I just want Benedict to say, move your hand forward. And Maggie would do a little thing in this direction. But if she has a hand here, she can make a little this direction. This is, this is a tremendous amount of, um, of information and a tre tremendous amount of challenges because you, you cross into a, the problem where some things are clearly artistic and some things clearly are not artistic. But some things also are very hard to tell. So the base pose, say I'm, I'm having Maggie walk back and forth, that would clearly be artistic. There's no way I can make a realistic walking uh, simulation. But the, the way Maggie smiles at you becomes clearly more of a technical problem because when does that smile really... How much does that smile maintain itself over time? If she has to talk, will those blend shapes clash with one another? The turning of the back, how do I prevent Maggie's back from turning uh, farther than it, than it actually might? I had this problem with her head where at one point her head would just kind of do that. There, there are several levels of problems where if you turn to face something from a neutral position, you'll turn to it like this. If you turn while looking up, you'll have a slight skew in your head. These problems uh, at first seem rather simple, but if you keep sort of this, this behavior up for a while, her head starts spinning in ways which are not, not possible. So, so there's a level of correction, there's a level of, of um, smoothing that goes on all the time. And the hands are basically a nightmare, which is my last uh, uh, problem at the moment, because doing the hair behind her ear is, is not really doable in, in terms of, of simulation purely, but then her hand is here, so I need to get that back to the simulation, and that sort of thing. But these are very interesting challenges that I've now sort of found myself taking the first step in. This is unique because there's no video. There's no definitive Maggie. In essence, you cannot play the game again and have exactly the same behavior from Maggie. Uh, in a way, it becomes a bit like, like a repeating dream. Every time, well, I suppose this metaphor is slightly screwed, but imagine a repeating dream which every night is the same but slightly different in important ways. That is different from watching a film because the film would be identical every single time. By having presence in it, you have an influence, you have an interaction with the character, which would not be possible in a cutscene which have been, has been made purely in, in video. At the same time, I as a developer have a tremendous amount of timing. The problem with allowing the player to, say, pause a sentence for a few seconds is that it can ruin completely the, the humorous timing. There's, there's a very uh, almost painful uh, uh, documentary 
I once saw, in which, in which comedians would wait a few seconds before telling the punchline, which in some ways ruined the joke. The same goes with a witty exchange between the characters. I cannot let the player do much there because that would ruin the fun that you would normally have from seeing those characters in a film. It gives me freedom as well in a sense that I can cut to another camera, I can do this, I can do this, because I sort of know where the player is. I can sort of know what is going on. I never have that situation where you exit a really interesting cutscene and then the character sort of stands there, kind of waiting for you to, to move that thumbstick. A unique benefit is also that it, it facilitates the feeling of, act, of acting. And I've noticed that I, I let someone else play the game who had never played it before, and she sort of just started ramming on the keys because she had no idea what the simulation was doing. And Maggie had this completely strange facial expression to give back. Not because she was genuinely confused or the AI determined that she was confused, but she was responding to someone who apparently just talked with her face really expressively. And the funny thing is, it felt better than when I had been playing it. In some ways, Maggie felt more human when I saw her play it. Um, and this also led me to believe that, that it's possible, theoretically, that I'm not a good actor within Chung Sam, and that someone else might be a better actor in that sense. But of course, it's an illusion, and it's, it's a very nice illusion, but in reality, um, this is nothing like acting. But the idea is, you get the feeling that some people have different... It's like Rami very subtly trying to tell me. Uh, <laughs> Another benefit of, of linearity is that we could do things like sound effects and music. Uh, Nathanael von Nispen, no, Nathanael Johannes von Nispen to Panreden made, made a wonderful soundtrack which we could record with an actual orchestra. And it can be timed to the dialogue in a way that we can create emotional scenes which are just as rich but you have interaction. As, as opposed, I should just say, to, to like a musical loop. We could loop the same music and just hope that it coincides correctly. Limitations are essentially speech. Anything which is heavily directed. Um, also, this includes things like walking or, of course, any uh, choice that might happen within the game. We cannot really get Maggie to do certain things or not certain things. There's a limitation on fuzziness because of this, because Sometimes Maggie has to get up and that will completely destroy any level of fuzziness she had in her back. Because if her back is twisted and then we start the walking animation, we get a really confusing element to that. That is something which is difficult and, and essentially a future challenge. There's also, and I did not at any point realize that what a nightmare that would become, but there's a lack of definitiveness. I can make an animation for Maggie, I can say move your head a little bit like this and then you talk and you sort of have this. But during the player's experience, the player might do something which disrupts exactly my animation. And in playtesting it, I had a few situations in which I made an idle AI, because I had no dialogue loaded in and I just had Maggie sort of standing there. And it looked wonderful, until I put in the dialogue and her whole behavior became ridiculous. In, in that essence, there is a, a distinct problem that while I make the game, I cannot exactly know what happens. In the same way that you orchestrate a fighting scene in a shooter, rather than actually dictate the shooting. So future work is, at this point, it's, it's more. After dinner date, I thought, I, I need to, to do research and development. And, and now, three years later, um, I'm sort of done with research and development. I'd, I'd just like to make more games. And I feel that with this approach, I can sort of do many, many things that I have seen in other media uh, within the limitations of more my financial uh, state and, and artistic state, rather than really limited by the medium itself. The drivers are also very, very, very basic right now. And that is something because I can't really find any uh, honest research on this or any real um, examples of how to do this. So it's a, an original body of work. There, there is expanding the type of situations, expanding what if you have a different type of human, what if you have an animal and, and this type of thing. And feature work linearity is something which I like to... I'm, I'm greatly enthused by, for instance, 30 Flights of Loving, which is sort of... which puts the, the cinematic cuts. And it can only do this because it's a linear game. And I realized that many of the temporal jumps of the, uh, the tricks that are used in cinema are now also applicable to games. Because I know to the millisecond what is happening. I can do a crossfade if I really want to, is essentially. 
So wrapping it up, I said games are a facilitation which we use for the illusion of consequence, but which we can use for the illusion of other things. The question is, can we convince the player to, to like certain illusions? Can we convince a player that acting is a nice illusion to have? Because if the player is very adamant that he's not having an illusion at all and that he really has consequence in a game, it can be quite difficult to change that in a way. And I, I, I said being alive because it's, it's a sort of uh, artistic cry for help in a way that you say, but well, it's about being alive, about the human condition. Um, it, it's more about doing things which other media have done before, about getting real experiences into games. Real experiences which simply don't have consequence. And this, this allows me to get to my final point. If we, if we make games with very little meaningful consequence, if we essentially have meaningless consequence games, there's a problem of what happens if someone has a gun and points it at you. Can we give the player something meaningless to do while someone holds him at gunpoint? Will the player smile? Or will he move his hands? Will he try and make the other person also frown? There is that problem that once we say, well, the player could, could move out of the way excitingly, that we essentially go, well, we're back to branching, essentially. We're essentially doing the same thing again that we did before. But this time we cannot punish the player because we've been telling him for hours that whatever he does is fine, and then suddenly we present him with, with a quick time event. And I find that an interesting, um, a, almost a little uh, intellectual proof of concept, in essence, that in a different model, it's exactly violence which is the problem, whereas in the original model, it's essentially narrative which forms a large part of the problem. And I'd like to leave some space for, for questions now. Oh, sorry, there's a... Do you have some footage of the game? Maybe... Uh... It, it, it's not on, but uh, the, the question was, do I have some footage of the game? I've, I've been... Oh, I see. Oh, I'm not on. I see. You warned me for this, and I still fell for it. Let's see. Wow. Good. I feel, I feel made out of plastic with all this one. <laughs> right, yes, I, I thought whether I would give, in essence, a presentation in which I try and sell an idea, in essence, or, or actually show the idea. The, the problem is that um, a lot of the last three years were, were a lot of proof of concepts, which, to some degree, have worked and have not. And... For the last few weeks, I've been reprogramming essentially the entire game for the final versions of many of these systems. And at this point, the game is not really in a state that it can start up. So when they asked me for the presentation, I, I felt really bad for not having made any videos to, to show. Because certain things like the head movements are, are basically thought out and the hand movements are, are to a large degree. But I can't show them, in essence. The, it's a, it's a, a leap of faith, in a way. I've got it. Well, I uh, also have a question. You talk about, well, explicitly not opening the box to, to keep things fuzzy. And in my mind, exactly the act of opening the box is uh, meant to have a good control over what a player gets out of a game. Is this better? You have a better control of uh, what the player gets out of the game. Um, and when you keep it fuzzy, like what you present now, it's, it kind of feels like um, you have to build something in where the player um, gets something out of the game, but you don't know what, what it is, because it, it is his own experience. Is that, is that kind of what you feel uh, is a direction for games to move towards? Um, I, I would definitely say it's about diversity more than, um, than a direction for games to, to move in. But the, the idea that you sort of need to... God, I've put myself very loud. Oh, God. <laughs> the idea that you would have to um, move uh, or, or rather open the box to give the player a certain experience is, a, is I think, a very um, dangerous line of thinking because the player can get something out of, for instance, Dear Esther. And Dear Esther never really has to open a box because, because it hardly has one, of course. Uh, but a player can get much out of that. There's a feeling of a thrill of, of consequence, in a way, like, like I saved the empire. But there's also a thrill of, I'm actually in this scene. And it, it, it's true that you no longer have that sort of... Uh, I wouldn't really say, say that I know how to, to phrase it exactly. Like a highlight to the player's career, that he felt he, he did something which you as a developer helped create, in essence. 
But at the same time, you're helping the player uh, imagine he's a father holding his first, firstborn son, in a way. I think there's a different direction these things then can move in. Um, hi. Um, it's going to be a long question. Um, you mentioned at one point that uh, some players were better, better actors in Chang Sung um, than others. I, I, I assume you mean that they're better at role playing, while other people, when playing the game, try to fool about and see what kind of effects they can get out of the game. And I can imagine someone uh, who's into role playing will play it once, not again, because you know it, it's it's their story basically. Whereas someone who g tries to fool about and plays with the game uh, would have a sense of replayability in that fact. How, how does that work? In um, if you if you see role playing as essentially um, making your own choices, so to say, then a linear game will have no replayability. I but if you if you see a film as a as a mystery that is going to be solved, then you can only really see a film once. If, you, if, if that is what you get out of the sixth sense, essentially, is, is what is going on, then the moment you finish the film, you can never see it again because you can never uh, recreate that. But if you see the sixth sense as, as um, by trying to think how to phrase it otherwise, but essentially not that, um, you could rewatch it. There are many books you can reread and, and that sort of thing. So if, if you really want choice, then obviously an, an, an acting game is not for you, in essence, because it wouldn't offer you any, any choice, nor expect you to, to want choice. I, I wouldn't know if a, if a fooling about player would, would get replayability out of it. I, I see it more in a sense that someone might rewatch uh, a film or, or reread a book. So I've, I've been uh, rewatching Deadwood now for, for, I think I'm in the fifth time in a way, because every single time there is something in the series where I go, I hadn't really realized this. And talking about it with people, we've, we've expanded our knowledge of it progressively. I hope that experience comes more from something like Tung Sam, that you might replay it to, to grasp the character better. Because essentially, at the end, you go, oh, now I see why she's sort of like that. And then at the start, you can see that was already in there. If, that's flattering myself as a writer, I suppose. But that's the hopeful, uh, the hopeful element to it. And I would say she was a better actor because I, as a developer, I'm so uh, knowledgeable about exactly the limitations of the system that when I go, so you can frown, you can smile, you can do this. And she was just like, okay, I'm just doing all these things. And it, it felt more like someone um, with an extreme expressive face, whereas I was more playing it with a sort of um, um, Keanu Reeves type of face because I was just doing, going through the motions in a way. Uh, first of all, thanks for the great talk. And next up, the question is, uh, how would you think that your version of uh, fuzzy design of narrative uh, would factor into the game industry in the following years to come, as opposed to the now more common linear and branching storylines? I think it sort of works post-top in a way that you could, um, to some extent, you could refit if, if you're talking about sort of the main industry type of thing, um, you could refit the, the clock to not tick between inaction and action, but between action and uh, this type of fuzzy play. You could potentially make the cutscenes in many games playable beyond the sort of half-life walking while people are talking type of, of approach. So the idea is essentially everything in Chung Sum could be reused in, in hypothetically Bioshock Infinite because there already is a lot of interaction between Booker and Elizabeth. And if, if there was a button for you to frown or to smile, Elizabeth could already respond to that. It wouldn't actually be that, that difficult from a, um, I suppose from a technical perspective. I also hope that, that as this would gain confidence in a way, it would lead the way to, um, to experiences which, which art games, if, if I can use that term, have been uh, gearing towards but have not really always manage to get there. For instance, something like the Arrestor is, is perfect as it is, but I hope that this type of approach allows many things like the Arrestor, but more complicated to, to appear. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because it's very different from film. You can make a film about two people lying in bed talking about their lives, and that's all very well. But if you can frame it from one of the characters' uh, point of view, you have an incredibly intimate version of, of the same scene. 
in a way that in film would feel slightly false. And in a game, for, for reasons completely beyond me, first-person perspective sort of works, and it sort of makes you feel in the scene, while well, some people would... <laughs> It, it can work and it can... I find in Chong Sum I have to cut to third person every now and then because otherwise the player just loses track of, of what is going on. But I hope in that sense that it gets an, an expansive type of uh, uh, application within, within games. Good, thank you. Uh, we are out of time for more questions. Um, give a big applause to Jeroen Stout. <laughs> <laughs>